Hey, what's good, everybody? Welcome to another live session with the Hype Magazine. I'm your editor in chief, Jerry Doby. And this evening, I've got an amazing, amazing guest with me by the name of Fiona Bloom. She was born into the music industry. Her father was like this rock god in the UK. And early on, you know what I mean? Like, age of four, she had her mindset on becoming like the stellar pianist and went to the Royal Academy of Music in London to start that. And somehow, some way, she ended up with scholarships for the arts in Philly, the University of Maryland. This turned into this long legacy of being a gatekeeper, a door opener, a ceiling crasher, and helping <laughs> further, you know, the impetus that hip hop was already gaining. She's had multiple record labels during her history. She's handled, represented, managed, or taking care of some of the luminaries in, you know, the hip hop world, the music world. I met her during a South by Southwest, during a Grammy event at South by Southwest in 2015. She, you know, we have been social media-ing as I was learning social media and, and she had Mr. Chopped, not slopped himself with her OG Ron G. You know yeah. what I mean? From Screwed Up Click. She introduced me to him. We did an impromptu interview right there. And then we went in and enjoyed Paul Wall tearing the stage down at the exclusive Grammy invite only event. Fiona Bloom. Yes. What's up, Jerry? The Bloom effect. <laughs> I didn't realize this house. was a video. <laughs> is this going on YouTube? Where is this going? It will go on YouTube. Okay. We'll, I, we'll also have editorial. It'll okay, go on good. the site, the audio. Yes, you know, the whole Depends night. on how you behave and stay uh, focused. Will The audio may end up on iHeart. You know okay. what I mean? So, okay. Okay. Well, I do have, <laughs> I do have the voice for iHeart. Yeah, um, you do. So, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you seem to have gotten my background pretty... Uh, on point, pretty 100, good for you. Um, and it's funny because normally my wall would have loads of great artwork, everything from MF Doom, who I signed on Subverse to Connected with Black Alicious pieces and Terry Quirk who did the Zombies art covers and you know all these amazing 60s you know rock and roll artists. But unfortunately you're looking at a clean blank slate over here because I just moved back to the ATL after 30 years in New York. So literally wow. still unpacking, but I really wanted to do this interview. So I'm like, screw the wall, let me just do this. That's and you fine. mentioned Paul Wall, funnily enough, Paul Wall, and here we are with my wall. <laughs> so chopped and screwed, baby, so yeah. Chopped and screwed. You know, you have, you know, in the past been voted by Billboard Biz as one of the top characters to follow in the music yes. industry. Yes. You've worked. You know, with a lot of clients, including South by Southwest, yes, CMJ, the New York University Tisch School of the Art, Billboard Conference. Yeah. 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 You've done all of these things, and so everybody has a, a an outlook as to who they feel Fiona Bloom is, and about her contributions to the fabric of the entertainment and the music and entertainment business. But what I would like to know is just kick it off with a reflective and from the inside looking out, tell me how you see Fiona Bloom. Whoa, that's a loaded question. I mean, that's a crazy prolific question that I feel I like- I have an unlimited to... account, so go ahead. Well, I feel like I need to look into a magnifying glass to answer that question not just through the Zoom. <laughs> um, but seriously, sometimes I wonder, you're asking me this at a really critical time in my life because uh, I'm feeling like I'm having another midlife crisis. Not really, in a good way, reinventing myself again. And with 50th anniversary of hip hop this year, I've been a little felt left out of the fabric of hip hop culture. And it's mainly me, it's mainly my fault. Um, or my doing, I should say. As far as what people think of me, they know I'm the. They know I'm a hustler. They know I work harder than anyone. People also know me as 
creating magic, you know, whatever that is, you know, whether it's with a wand or blowing fairy dust, like literally <laughs> speaking, right? They know me. That's why the company, The Bloom Effect was such a great name because the people were like, yo, give me some of that Bloom Effect. And I'm like, what is it you want? That, that, that effect that I can't describe it, but whatever you do to create this stuff that builds this profile, that creates this buzz, that builds this, you know, bridge and 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 brings everybody on point to know like everybody's, you know, seeing who who we are and who this is and the brand and the art and the name and the, you know, and, and I'm like, all right, we could do that. But as far as, you know, what I want people to see or to think, you know, I haven't written a book yet. I've been working on a book or working in my mind on a book for years. I just haven't had a, the time to sit down and, and, and stay quiet, be quiet, you know, in a secluded place and just write. Haven't done that yet. You know, there's a, there's a documentary I'd like to do. There's a, you know, there's the book, not the memoir, but just a book on my journey so far, memoir later. Haven't done all that. So here we are 50 years in hip hop which I've done a tremendous amount of hip hop culture building, cultivating scenes in Atlanta, whether it was on radio, whether it was developing artists, whether it was giving artists their first shows in the South, um, whether it was building festivals, whether it was at South by Southwest and CMJ with international hip hop, then in New York, the list goes on and on and on with building two record labels, successful hip hop labels, you know, now to forward into uh, the Bloom Effect, right? Which I've done quite a bit of hip hop with the Bloom Effect too, not as much as the past, but here's what's happening. You know, I'm noticing that I'm being left out of history books. I'm being left out of the story, you know, whether it was the outcast story, which I'm very prominently involved in their beginnings, or whether it was MF Doom's story. I mean, yes, people, you do hear my name mentioned in, in, in MF Doom, but not nearly where it should be in regards to MF Doom. You know, there's Cool Keith, there's, you know, Black Alicious, there's, I mean, the list goes on and on. There's international hip hop, there's, you know, the Source magazine, there's Game, Hip Hop Honeys, you know, with the DVD series with Jonathan Schechter. There's a lot of things that people don't know about me where I helped build these entities and put them on the map. So, you know, rather than get upset about it and, and feel bitter, I'm not bitter, I'm not upset. I just look at this like, my story is gonna come. I If I'm the one that has to tell my story, so be it. If others haven't written me into their story about the artists that I've helped put on the map or scenes I've helped develop, if I've somehow had been an oversight, it's okay. It's cool. I think the reason, Jerry, that I've been an oversight on a few things. Now, granted, nobody's going to deny anything I've brought to the table. Because if you bring something up to somebody, they'll be like, "She's that's true. She did that. She was there. She helped with this. She did that. It's all true stuff. It's all facts. It's all trivia, real, not trivia, real, not trivial, but real Hip hop trivia, music trivia, facts. Yes, they'll say that. But I think my biggest reason why it's a fault and why there's a disconnect is because I'm a multi hyphenate. I never stayed in one lane. Had I have just done hip hop, I would be massive. Had I have just done rock, had I just been the record label mogul and continued to build my record labels, I'd have a massive empire. If I was just on radio, I would have been a huge, wildly popular radio personality with a huge syndicated radio show on iHeart and everywhere else. But I never stuck to one thing. I And genres too. I'm in all the genres. I work in pop. I work in rock. I work in roots. I work in jazz. I work in hip hop. I work in rock. I work in country. I, I'm just... And so to some people, it looks like I'm kind of all over the map. But... In these days, I'm broad, I'm a generalist, and a lot of people are sort of catching up to me being that type of person, and that's okay. I didn't take, you know, I didn't follow the easy path. And I'm not saying anything's easy, nothing is easy. I didn't follow the traditional path of staying on course and building the scene, staying in the pocket in that scene and staying and growing and being at the top. I just diverted. I went in many, many, many different ways, but I traveled the world. I mean, yes, I could have traveled the world just staying in hip hop or just staying in rock, but I traveled the world in different cultures, in different scenes, you know, in different places that uh, 
you know, I helped develop that I wouldn't have developed if I was just staying in rock or jazz or pop or folk or hip hop. So that's what it is. And I feel like I'm okay with that. I'm still, I'm in my fifties. I'm still relatively young, knock on wood. I have a few more years to get my story out. My story better come out. It's me that's going to write it. Totally fine. I hope to God people read it. I think they will. I know I have an audience and I know that I'm inspiring because people told me all around the world over many, many years that I've inspired them to start their own companies or their own entities. I've inspired artists to pick back up when they basically gave up. I've inspired, you know, writers to write books. I've inspired people like Gina, homegirl Gina, you know, that was in a different industry that came back. The list goes on and on and on and on of who I've mentored, who I've inspired, and who I've been able to kickstart their careers, their dreams, and being able to encourage them and tell them that anything's possible. And I can make my bed at night and sleep in my bed and wake up in the morning and be, yeah, I've done all this. So my story's gonna come, it's going to be fine. I'm not gonna be dead before I get my flowers. I'm going to get my flowers. I'm we're going to working still on it right alive. now. I'm we're going to get my on it right now. We're exactly. working on it right now. Exactly. That's what we're doing. So, so that question was a little loaded. It was a little long winded. It's but okay. that's a difficult question to sort of get into and analyze. But that's really the truth of how I see Fiona Bloom looking from the inside. Uh, what did you from the outside inside. within? From looking the inside, from the inside looking inside out. Yeah. Out looking from the inside out. The only reason, one of the only reasons I'd never became a massive, massive mogul in this business, because truthfully, I know I would have. I know I would have. And I'm saying it as if it's the past, as if it's too late now. It's not too late. I am in my mid 50s. So technically, I have another 10 years in me to become a mogul. But I don't even know if that's what I want. You know, I want to keep doing what I do in the trenches and developing and creating and discovering and, and building cool things and going into new technologies and, you know, investing in, you know, platforms that nobody's heard of and taking chances and risks. That's me. I just love to take risks. I'm never going to stop taking risks. Okay. Well, you've Talking about risk, you've had some benchmark risk taking going on in your life for the time you started out, uh, you know, with your partner, Michelle Roche, uh, starting with the Roche and Bloom firm, you know, back in the early 90s. You walked your way uh, through that and developed with the speech and communications and broadcast school in Georgia. She's a professional freaking student, for God's yeah. sake. I'm you know a, what I mean? a public speaker. Yeah, and a public I've got the gift speaker. of gab. I've got yeah, the gift you of gab. know what I mean? And 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 then she landed a gig at WTS, WSTR 94.1. 94.1, yeah. And yeah. WRFG 89.3 FM. Which I had a hip hop show, which I had a hip hop show. Wildly popular hip hop uh, DJ. And I interviewed a lot of artists, everybody from the far side. You know, George Clinton used to come on my show, Easy E, rest in peace. Uh, Fat Joe. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. In fact, I was the first person to bring Fat Joe to the South. Wow. I brought him down to Atlanta to perform at a club called Diamonds and Pearls. And we did an in-store at this brand new record store at the time called Earwax. Um, and um, I was one of the first DJs to play his album and his single, You Gotta Flow Joe. Fat Joe the Gangster. You Gotta Flow Joe. You Gotta Flow Joe. When yeah. he was on records that came out in 1993 so you know that's my history with fat joe and then george clinton used to come on my show you know parliament funkadelic he didn't really do many interviews down here but he always wanted to chat with me always you're you're an amazing conversationalist and you're so interesting to talk to i, I we were hanging out at the irish fest <laughs> exactly I, there you go irish fest this will be talked to everybody their cat yeah, uncle yeah. and dog yeah, and yeah. like nobody was a stranger so mm -hmm. that is one of the key points that yeah. probably set you on your road uh when you know Roche and Bloom kicked off you're not afraid to say hi no and let's backtrack a bit because before Roche and Bloom happened I was only in my early 20s maybe mid 24 25 without giving out my real age we know we were in I'm in my 50s but prior to Roche and Bloom prior to Roche and Bloom I mean let's give it up to college radio the launch pad was Georgia State University's college radio station, WRAS 
88.5 FM, which did at that point have 100,000 watts. So their tower was, you know, really signaling really, really strong throughout almost the whole of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So a lot of commercial stations were checking to the left to recruit their talent. And I did super well on 88.5. People to this day remember me in Atlanta from WRAS. They remember that college radio show. I had a jazz show. I did overnights. I did specialty shows. I did everything on that show, including reading the news. So I wanted to make that clear because that's how Michelle Roche even found out about me. Michelle was booking a Buckhead Jazz Club or doing PR marketing for Buckhead Jazz. It's a club uh, not that far from where I live right now, actually, in Buckhead on Peachtree Street. And she called up my show and said, would you be into giving away a few pairs of tickets, maybe doing some interviews with some of the artists that come through that we've booked? And I said, absolutely. I'd love to show you my club. Come have dinner with us. Come see a show. I'd love you to experience it. And listen, Jerry, the reason why people were sweating us like this, 100,000 watts. Yeah. We were a powerful, even though it was college, we, and it was a training ground, we were a powerful, influential radio station. Left of dial, college, but powerful. So I was getting all kinds of invites to restaurants, free tickets, club invites, gifts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Michelle and I just hit it off. And we decided after I finished my stint with graduating at Georgia State, we decided let's start a firm together. And that's how Roche and Bloom kind of kicked off, yeah. And once you took off and took over Atlanta, both the airwave, yeah. the music scene, yeah. and the parties. Yes, yes. Because you were the party person of Atlanta. I, I mean, I, I was. Outcast, Escape, yes. Lil John as a DJ during your last yeah. party, I think, before you left Atlanta, right? Yes, they gave and... me a big goodbye party. Dallas, Austin, Joy, Arrested Development, everybody was out. Escape performed, Outcast performed. Bill Campbell, who was the mayor at the time, came to send me off. It was a big, big deal. I even made Peach Buzz, which is the gossip column of the Atlanta Journal Constitution, the daily paper. Wow. So mm -hmm. that was saying goodbye to saying goodbye. what would be another benchmark move. You moved to New York, joined I EMI. Did I did? And my first project, one of my first projects, was Hard to Earn, Gangstar, and then a bunch of under smaller projects that they gave me. But I loved working with Gangstar, and I got to become quite friendly with Guru. You know, with Keith, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Still yeah. can't believe he's not with us. You know, we built a really nice friendship over the years. But yeah, I mean, it was great to be at EMI Chrysalis. It was short lived. You know, it, it was a tough gig for me because going from party promoter locally to doing regional PR and promo to being a, and a DJ. And then suddenly at a major label, mid level position with a pretty big salary at 26 years old. You know, I, I will say it was a fluke, you mm -hmm. know. I Did I earn my stars? No. The reason I got the job, and Daniel Glass will be the first to tell you, who was the president at the time, who now has his own successful indie record label, Glass Note Records. Daniel Glass, you know, he saw something in me. He saw this young, he, he watched me from afar. He saw how I would maneuver in and out of circles. You know, this white, white, well, I would always say four strikes against me, you know, being white, being Jewish, being female, being British in the South. He would see that coming in from New York and watch me weave in and out of like, you know, the black folks circle to the Latinas over here, to the white folk over there, to the Jewish crowd, to the gay crowd, to the this crowd. And he's like, who is this young woman? Like with this crazy energy and this, you know, animated, you know, person with an English accent that was very charming and, and fun and personable and hilarious and knowledgeable and... He was blown away by that. He was like, I don't know your skill set. I don't really know your experience in the mm. industry, which I didn't have in, in terms of record industry. Mm. But he he took a chance. He took a chance. Just like A&R people did back in the day when they signed artists that had no followings. They would sign artists at a club because they loved the music. They loved the performance. They loved the style. They like something about you. I'm, we're going to make you, we're going to make you, we're going to break you, something about you. Nobody does that anymore. The same way nobody's going to do what happened to me 
end of 1993 with that job in New York to start January 2nd, 1994. Nobody, it barely, rarely happens, rarely happens. I didn't have the resume, not on national, didn't have a national resume. But you know what? Yeah, everybody has to start somewhere. And, you know, you are on the inside looking out when from the terms of hip hop because you started in the trenches kind of with hip hop in that market, right? And mm -hmm. helped develop, open the gates, did the radio. People were familiar. Gangstar, you know, was already familiar with you from your radio days. Mm -hmm. So it was just a natural, you know, elevation coming over and dealing with them at EMI. You know, and then, you know, maybe you got frustrated or or didn't move as fast or, but they didn't understand hip hop as suits and bean counters the way you right. did right. from the street side. Yeah. Coming yeah. up the elevator, not starting coming down from the penthouse, yeah. but from the streets yeah. up with the culture. And, and that's truthfully the job that they gave me was street was, even though I was director of marketing, my area of marketing was street you mm -hmm. know, developing, developing and street organic street marketing, which, you know, I don't think there's even a job title in record labels for years now called street marketing, mm -hmm. but that's kind of what I spearheaded at uh, EMI Chrysalis. And it was great for me, but the problem was it was very to the books and you had to come up with marketing plans and stick by them. And there were 9 a.m. meetings, which I'm like, I was out of the clubs till three in the morning and I would be late. And, you know, everybody's wearing suits, like you said, pin up suits and blah, blah, blah. And I just, I felt very suffocated. I, I just, I didn't feel, in Atlanta, I was myself and wild and, you know, doing things and discovering and mingling. And I couldn't do that at EMI. I was told no, no to this, no to that. And then when it came to bringing up ideas in the meetings, no one would listen to me. I mean, they just, I'd have maybe 20 seconds and then move on to somebody that would speak for like five minutes. It was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. The, it was the, crazy. the misogyny is crazy. Plus, you know, they didn't understand what you were saying. You were telling them what they needed to know, but they wanted to hear it from a, a corporate fond, fond, fond standpoint. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Which is garbage. Yeah. So, but <laughs> you, you were a natural PR person. And so your next phase, Zero Hour Records, you well, took over as director of PR. Go ahead. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Again, very untraditional, you know, very unorthodox way of doing things for me, for my well, journey. Because, of it. yeah, no, I know. But the thing is, you know, even at EMI, just in their defense, maybe some of the things I said were not exactly, you know, feasible or, uh, you know, lucrative. I don't know, right? I mean, I didn't, I was, Jerry, I was learning. I, I, I didn't know the ropes of the record industry. Mm. I just didn't. I just didn't. And I'm not saying maybe I got like, because, you know, I, I, that job was about a year and a half, maybe a little less than a year and a half. And I don't want to say that maybe it's because I did a crap job. No, not at all. I think it was just, you know, not a comfortable look for me. You know, it wasn't it was a me. corporate structure. Corporate structure was not me, clearly yeah. not me. Yeah. And, you know, not seeing eye to eye and not being able to adapt the way that I could or should and realizing that we were butting heads and that uh, I was miserable, miserable. So yes, Zero Hour came knocking and here's the deal. It was a rock label. You know, I miss my hip hop, you know, at EMI. I was doing other genres, but at least I had the gang stars and Soul Sonics and a group called Eternal, you know, which was like a, R&B soul group or R&B group, share, you know, I had I had flavor there. They gave me flavor. Mm -hmm. Zero Hour had no flavor, completely indie rock. Mm -hmm. Now, if it wasn't for my training at Album 88's college radio, I wouldn't really even know about indie rock, right? right. So luckily, the college radio was a launch pad for everything for me, right? Everything. So, you know, the indie rock, I could fake it. I could talk the talk, walk the walk, kind of faking it. I needed a job. I didn't want to be unemployed in New York. Right. Everyone, yeah. everyone said, why don't you just go back to Atlanta? It will be so easy for you. I'm like, after that big goodbye party, after that huge send off, are you kidding me to go back to Atlanta? Jerry, no way, no way. Pride, I had pride, right? Not anymore. <laughs> I had pride back then, I'm still in my twenties. So I took this job at zero hour. You know, what sold the boss at the time was, um, you know, just my winning attitude, my I can do anything attitude, you know, just, yeah, I've done PR, I've done national PR. I'd never done national PR. Roche and Bloom, Michelle Roche did the PR. I called on radio stations. Mm. I did radio promo. I mean, it's Teamwork. all about 
mixed bag, okay. yeah, of course. But I'd never actually done placements in national magazines like Rolling Stone, Newsweek, Spin, New York Times, you know, Flaunt, Raygun, whatever it is, whatever it was, you know, Billboard, Variety. I'd never actually placed articles or features. Locally, mm. yes, in Atlanta, AJC, Creative Loafing, you know, local, but never on a national level. So my boss really took a chance in me. And he said the reason why he did was because he liked my energy, he liked my passion, and he knew that with my energy and passion and my determination, I was gonna win. We were gonna win. And we did. We won huge, huge. Because I ended up going back to Daniel Gloss, who formed a partnership with Doug Morris called mm -hmm. Rising Tide, came back to Daniel. They were looking to acquire indie labels and looking to sign you know, uh, uh, different artists, they needed to build their roster. So that's where 321 came in? No, 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 no. This is before 321. This is just zero hour in general. Okay. Um, the, rock, the rock stuff. I called up Daniel. I said, Daniel, you need to see what we're doing here. Daniel said, let, let, let's have a meeting. Let's let's do it. I put together my boss with Doug Morris and, and uh, Daniel, closed doors, six hours, turned out to be a $20 million deal. Mm. And yeah. I got nothing. I got a $7,000 bonus. Because I didn't have the business savvy. I really, I wasn't really a businesswoman. I was very much a promoter, party promoter, marketer, DJ, you know, personality. You know, I'm still very new in the game, very green, very wet behind the ears, right? So here's this huge deal giving, uh, you know, a, a huge boost and a huge injection to this indie jumpstart label, start, you know, startup label. And all of a sudden, I was golden. Even though I only got a seven grand bonus, my boss did say to me, Fiona, you're golden. You know, what do you want to do? I'll give you anything you want. I should have said $100,000. Should have said I five million say, right then on the spot. <laughs> but what I did say was, I'd love to start my own hip hop label. And I mm. called it 321. Ah. Because zero, zero hour, three, two, one, zero. And that was that. And That's my subsidiary. first subsidiary. You got a subsidiary. Okay, so you got a label deal with zero. I got a label deal. Yes, that's okay. what I got out of it. So seven Before grand. people were even talking about label deals. You know what I mean? Especially yeah. on the independent side. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me ask you on the business tip. You know, everybody, yeah. we have our theory. We go to the university yeah. and we get yeah. theory, right? Mm -hmm. Then we come out and we get real world education. What was the most surprising part the about the business of the music business for you when you woke up and realized what was really going on what i realized was nobody cares about the artist as much they just care about how it's going to you know what the out of the box sales were that week like if we don't hit a number for out of the box if we don't ship a certain amount of units and product i was like what units product what I'm realizing, well, yes, that's the business. Mm -hmm. The business is the product. The business is the units, the numbers, the statistics, the analytics is the business. And I realized then, you know, really at EMI was when I realized that, when they were just throwing millions of dollars up against the wall, basically crapshoot, seeing what stuck and what didn't. And if something didn't stick, they were on to the next. And I'm like, wait, wait, you can't be on to the next. I'm... I'm still working on this project. I'm still like, I, I barely skimmed the surface. And they're like, we've moved on. We've moved on. It, 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 there's a six week window. It's like, we've moved on. Mm. I'm like, oh my goodness. I can't, this is not the philosophy that is my philosophy. This is not my aesthetic. This is not my DNA. This is not my, you know, um, it's not my world. And so with zero hour, even though it was very business there too, at least I had the freedom to do certain things. But the bottom line was always the bottom line. Let's be clear. The bottom line was always like, is this going to sell? Are we going to make money? Are we going to profit? Are we going to be in the green? And, you know, so there was a lot of pressure for me to do that with 321, with making sure that when I'm signing stuff, it explodes. And thankfully, the timing was great. The market was ripe. And everything I was signing completely completely blew up and here came black alicious turning yeah. the industry on its ear I especially remember. with a to g cut chemist remix oh my yeah. god the alphabet remix alphabet aerobics rest in peace gab gift of gab died not that long ago oh yeah that? yeah and i tried to sign atmosphere i mean i drove in a blizzard in four feet of snow 
to Minneapolis uh, to go see him live. He was only very local. Nobody had heard of Slug or Atmosphere outside of Minneapolis. And I wanted to sign him too. We would have signed him, but my partner at the time, who was Big Just from Company Flow with 321, he put his foot down. He said, we don't need another Eminem. Eminem just got signed. I'm thinking, what? First of all, Slug and Atmosphere is not even white. He's mm. mixed race. So anyway, I just got stamped out of that one, you know, because uh, being a woman in the business, sometimes mm. your voice and your ideas don't always get heard, you know. But so. you were successful. Look, from the East Coast with Cool Keith and the Ultra Magnetic MCs, yeah. you know what I mean, Black Alicious, and then to the West Coast, Freestyle oh, Fellowship. Yeah. Oh, my God. The oh, Mer yeah. Park crew, you know, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Micah Nine, Medusa, those yeah. people. Living Legends, Living yeah. Legends, Mystic Journeyman. I was the first to bring Mystic Journeyman, Living Legends to South by Southwest. I was the first to bring the whole Rhyme Sayers crew to South by Southwest. I was basically the hip hop booker. Outside of Texas rap, there was no hip hop at South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. There was none. Right. We're talking right. mid to late 90s. There was none. Right. So I partnered with Hip Hop Mecca who were two or three guys on the ground in Austin, young guys in Austin. Mm -hmm. I partnered with them and said, let's do all this national hip hop stuff. And mm -hmm. we blew it up. We blew it up. Wow. And I brought it to A3C. I brought it to CMJ. We just blew it up. Yeah. Okay. So rise and fall, everybody has them. The music industry is not only bad or not, I don't want to say bad because that's probably a, a, a horrible word to choose but it's stressful and difficult on the mental <laughs> health yeah and yeah. you put a lot of energy into your dreams especially things that are your baby like you know three two one you had um, to you decided to let that go but it yeah. stressed you to the point where you you know were affected physically you were medically so i was in hospital for six weeks mm, mm, mm. yeah i ended up having a serious tumor and yeah, luckily I recovered from it, but it was it was scary. It was very, very scary. I'll never forget that time. Never. I'm glad um, you're and, here. Yes, yes. So that that put me in the hospital. And um, and then soon after that, I still had it in me to want to start another record label. This one I owned. Because remember, mm. Zero Hour owned 321. Mm -hmm. It was my label, my vision. But again, I'm not a businesswoman. I wasn't so great with the business and the paperwork and negotiating. Negotiating. So this time I was like, I want paper. I want a, uh, a contract. I want to sign it. I want this deal. I want these stipulations. And that's when I started Subverse. I said, I'm going to do this right. And, and bang, was, you signed bang. MF Doom. Yes. Rest MF Doom. in peace. Yeah, best, I, I, yeah, rest in peace, MF Doom. Wow. Yeah, and I put him on the map. I mean, you know, being the hot publicist that I was, I uh, got him in every single magazine you could imagine from Alternative Press to Spin to Newsweek to Rolling Stone to High Times to New York Times to CBS to, I mean, you name it. Entertainment Weekly, eh? and, you know. Ah. Yes, yes, that too. Yes, Entertainment yeah. Weekly. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't leave any stone unturned. I hustled so hard for Doom and I did incredible epic shows with him, mm -hmm. More, with him before he started having the imposter. Because later on in his Doom days, he would send someone else out with a metal face. But I always had the real Doom, always. But I had epic shows with him, epic, epic shows. One where he staged a fight uh, where it looked like he put uh, stabbed someone to death because the sword went through the heart and blood was spat spattered out everywhere. Lights came on. It was a SOBs. The police came. It was insane. We all like ducked down. We thought there was a shooting and turned out it was a complete prank. And Doom set the whole thing up. Wow. That was my show. That was my show. Wow. I produced that, that was... show. That was Leg... the most historic show to this day. People talk about it. Legendary. Legendary. Okay. So... <clears throat> She wasn't doing things small. She didn't do anything small. Like you're in the middle of Tribeca. It's a hundred thousand square foot yes. space. You know, yes, 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 uh, yes. Which you were able to, as an entrepreneur and a business person, you were often, you know, you were able to get rental income from it when you weren't using it. So, yo, you're like on it from day one. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me give credit to where credit's due on that. I started Subverse. I brought Big Just from Company Flow, who was my partner at 321. Mm -hmm. I brought him over as an official 
partner sign deal with Subverse. Mm -hmm. And the reason I had Subverse to begin with was because the publisher of a magazine, a hip hop magazine called Stress, mm. a guy called Ket, who now has the Graffiti Museum in Miami, the Hip Hop Graffiti Museum, you've got to go see that in Miami. Mm. So anyway, Ket was the one that introduced me to the financier, Peter Lupoff, who was at Bear Stearns at the time. He was desperate to get into the record industry, desperate. He wanted to be in hip hop, he's a white Jewish guy, wanted to be in hip hop, bad. Saw what I was doing, Ket introduced us. Next thing you know, Peter's like, I want to buy in. So he put up 100K and then he put up another 250. And then I found another 150K with support online hip hop, SOATH.com. They mm. gave me 150K. And then next thing you know, we were raising more money because he has the Bear Stearns Wall Street background. So then we suddenly a million, two million. He bought the space. Uh, the 100,000 square foot space in Tribeca, right down the street from World Trade Center. This is in 1999, early 2000. And we sublet it out to a web hip hop web company called Hooked, hooked.com, H-O-O-K-T.com. And the claim to fame from Hooked is Daytuan Thomas. I knew Daytuan when he was a little 19 year old running around Hooked and then mm. went on to start King and XXL and run billboard and run this and run that and vibe and everything else. Dayton Thomas known that cat since he was 19 years old, nothing but love. We're, we're like this. So throughout, and I'm including uh, myself in this category, you've had um, an am amazing relationship with urban media. Cause I, I cover everything from rock from Aretha Franklin to, you know, Johnny cash. So, mm -hmm. but we're urban based, we're owned. You know what I mean? You you you've been in the culture, and where others and I'm I'm saying this. This is not a question. It's a declaration. So, from the outside looking in and watching the career, you've contributed where others have extracted and run away with the proceeds of the culture. Yeah. You know what I mean? 100%. Like, yeah. there anybody who there's no culture vulture tag that can be applied to Bloom Effect. Fiona Bloom or anything that she's touched. She has been legitimately organically in love with hip hop since she got exposed to it. She's represented it on air. On I've watched her on air, on the ground. She knows everybody, their cat, uncle, and dog. And <laughs> you know, yeah. If you if yeah. I, you know, I, I watched a movie one time where this 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 special forces guy. You know, told somebody, I'm a good number to have. Fiona is a good number to have. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you're I doing people, this business. Yeah, I think people really appreciate that about me. But I think people always find to my default or my demise. That's maybe one of the reasons why, again, I didn't get to the top, top, top level. You know, I'm not even going to mention those names because oh, I don't want to mention those names right now because they're in the news negatively at the moment, I think you know who I'm talking about, but you know, listen, I, I, I didn't, I don't really care about the celebrity status. I don't really care about, I never, I was never driven by multi, multi, multi millions of dollars. I never took to this business or this culture or being in hip hop because I saw hmm, capitalistic approach of being an opportunist of being a, I can cash in and I can get this, that, and the other. Jerry, that was never, ever, ever my MO. Did I want to have a, you know, comfortable living, be able to take care of my family, be able to take some holidays, you know, buy some real estate. Yeah, sure, sure. That was not, that, that is nice. Yes. But I never wanted to go to those other extremes and it's okay if others have, but I've, I've always kept it real. Like you said, I've always kept it real. I am not a culture vulture. People are coming out of the woodworks with this 50th anniversary of hip hop. There's people that I, I'm like, wait, you're you're involved in a hip hop 50 event or you're doing a, you know, a contributions to hip hop when you didn't even, when I don't even know that you were doing hip hop all these years. I'm like, but I've always, I mean, I may have left hip hop for a minute for like seven years, but then I was doing international hip hop. I didn't leave hip hop. I just wasn't doing trap and drill and, you know, some of the rap and, and strip club stuff. I, I you know, I, I felt like it lost touch with me. And so I was looking overseas to get my fulfillment and my energy and my, you know, passion. So I never left it, 
And now I'm back in full, full front because I'm, you know, working with Master Ace on his falling season, you know, musical theatre project. You know, I'm probably going to do some things with Earwax here in Atlanta with Talib Shabazz and Jazz. I'm working with the mayor's office. You know, I want to do more things with hip hop down here. I, you know, going to be probably working with Bahamadia again. I'm going to be working with, oh, um, yeah. you know, yeah, Tracy Desar is an international rapper that's got accepted to South by Southwest this year. I'm looking after her at South by Southwest. I, I you know, hip hop is in my blood. I mean, I, I'm a kid in a candy store when I'm listening to it, when I'm talking to people in it, when I'm, you know, dealing with the culture, I get excited. I have a big smile on my face from ear to ear. So I never left it. You know what I mean? I never left it. Yes, you didn't see me at A3C the last five years. Yes, you didn't see me at, uh, you know, the, the hip hop uh, brunch that the mayor's office did, you know, three months ago, because I was in Scotland. You know, I, I, I travel overseas a lot too, right? Because I work with international artists. That's been my whole thing. I, I work a lot around the globe, right? And it's all styles of music. But yeah, there's some of these culture vultures that are back in because there's this hip hop 50th anniversary and hey, I can make some money or we can make some noise or we could jumpstart this because it's 50 years. Nah, that's not my thing. I've never done that. I've never been about that. Everything I've done is very organic, very authentic, with integrity and pure, You're with a pure heart. You know what I mean? Like really with a pure heart. I love you for that. For real, mm. for real. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, I love you yeah. for that. Appreciate yeah. you. Thank you yeah. for that. So, you know, natural progression. She started with the parties. She hit the party section again. <laughs> Joe's Pub, New York. What yeah. late yeah. night booker? You booked yeah. Missy Elliott? Oh, oh no, 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 not Missy Elliott. I booked Jasmine Sullivan's first show. Missy ah. was behind Jasmine Sullivan. Missy brought her in. Okay. I, I took Missy to her VIP seats. Okay, okay. And I she she wanted me to book Jasmine Sullivan. She says first show. She's like fifteen or sixteen years old. Her parents were managing her. Lovely, lovely people. And that's that was my claim with the Jasmine Sullivan Missy Elliott story at Joe's Pub. And I developed this incredibly successful late night series every single night till three, four in the morning, mm. which was a crazy lifestyle. I got really burnt out of it, but I did some incredible, historic, epic, legendary shows, legendary shows. You know, I'm surprised after that, you know, the, the show market, you could have been like the female Don Kirshner's rock concert. Yeah. Series. You remember that show? Yes. Oh, yes, when I, yes. I used to watch that show every week. I loved it when I was coming up. Just music. Yes. There's a lot of things I could have been. There's a lot of things I could have been. You, they say you're not supposed to have any regrets, right? You're not supposed to have any, any regrets. After Joe's Pub, I took a job at TVT. I got this incredible job as an international marketing director for TVT. How do and we not they, meet? I, I used to work... Uh, Big Chan from Doggy's Angels. Yeah. Oh, when they wow. were on TVT. Yes. Yes. Well, I was looking after Pitbull, Yin Yang Twins, Little okay. John, you know, uh, and I did all the international stuff for them. Okay. So on tour internationally, bringing international journalists to America, setting up their parties, taking them to strip clubs, all of that. That was my job. Um, and I loved it, you know, and it was almost full circle back to Atlanta because it was like, you know, Yin Yang's album, United States of Atlanta. And I'm like, and I came out of Atlanta and this is my thing and I'm back in hip hop and hey, little John, remember me? You know, that kind of right, thing. Right. Yin Yang weren't really doing it back then because I was, you know, I left in 1993, end of 93. Little John was in the strip clubs. Little John wasn't even doing it either. Little John was a DJ in the strip clubs. Uh, he was interning for So So Deaf, Jermaine Dupree. That's mm. how I know Little John. So little John came and said goodbye to me at my goodbye party. He was DJing. But when I saw him all these years later, 2006, 2007, he's pretty much a star at that point. And I'm like, little John, it's Fiona B. And he's like, what? You know. Ah, that was a great reunion. I'm sure he was smiling. Like, Yeah, it was, it was a nice reunion. It was a really nice reunion. And that's where Pitbull came up. You know, you know, I watched, I basically helped launch Pitbull. Wow. So... New as a newcomer, you had Pitbull. Look at him now, though. Like yeah, well, yeah, as a global newcomer, sensation. Yeah, oh my god. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know I mean? But I can truthfully say I was there from the beginning of his career. Really? Absolutely like true. there. Absolutely like, true. Absolutely true. He was he on TVT. That, I didn't even know this. He absolutely was. 
he was on the Yin Yang album. That's his claim to fame was Yin Yang. Ah, see, I only did either Yin Yang or Little John. It was one of the two. It was a little well, Little John probably produced it. It was Yin Yang and Mr. Collie Park and Pitbull came up on a verse or two, and the rest was history. I didn't know TBT had that kind of reach, but because I only dealt with Doggy's Angels, so I didn't yeah. know exactly what you know the tentacles. And then you know, one day I was going to the TBT office downtown Los Angeles, and the next day. It was gone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same with us in New York. Crazy uh, time, crazy time. Teja Moses was on TBT. I mean, I still to this yeah. day stay in touch with Teja's sister who manages her, Tamia. Ah. Tamia. I love Teja. Love Teja. Okay. So 20 years later, record label situation is gone. You're not working yeah. for anybody else in no. full. Yeah. The bloom effect is in. Yeah. Was born. Like, it's full effect. The bloom is, is in full, full effect. effect. Yeah, the blue. Yeah, I, you know what, Jerry? I decided why go work for anyone else now? You know, I've I've been the entrepreneur my whole life. I've worked jobs here and there, whether it was zero hour, you know, whether it was TVT, you know, labels, indie labels, major labels, you know, other entities. I thought to myself, I've got the network, I've got the knowledge, I've got the experience. Why don't I just do this for real? Like just launch a multimedia agency, you know, that does a one-stop shop, you know, PR. So, so all my talents can be put to use in one, under one umbrella, you know, PR, marketing, branding, international consulting, you know, specialized events, you know, uh, incidental bookings, you know, uh, consulting, all of that stuff. Why don't I just do that under an umbrella, create my own entity, call it the bloom effect. And okay. that's what I did. And here I am several years later and uh it's still going and i'm you know things are great uh, i've turned a corner i've been making money and um you know there were ups and downs as you start any business as, as it comes with any business up and downs um but now i feel like i'm in a place where hopefully no more downs and only up from here and i've just come back to atlanta where my whole life started and um i'm really excited to be back in the mix doing great things with the bloom effect. You know, my goal is also to uh, do some parties down here again on the local, on the ground locally, you know, get in with the mayor's office and cultural affairs and all of that. And my plan is to, to develop talent on the film side, film and TV, which is booming down here. And also maybe get back on radio. You haven't heard the last of radio days, maybe get back on the radio. And I'd also like to teach uh, adjunct professor, uh, music business course, uh, international marketing course, you know, music marketing course, something on the lines of my expertise. So yeah, I, I have a lot more energy in me, Jerry, a lot more years to give, you know, and a lot more deals to make and a lot more hustle and a lot of big plans in my peripheral. So I just, um, I feel I can do it. You know, I can, I'm in my fifties, but they ain't no stopping me now. You know, a lot of people lie to themselves as they navigate the maze of whatever career they're going through and say, oh, I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. That's what they want to project outwardly. But you really are living the dream. I personally, military brat, my military career, I didn't feel like I would be at this level um, in the media space. And I started out doing PR and unit publicist stuff and building sets and I'm like, man, after looking at a few journalists, I'm like, that's, I want to have the platform for people to tell their stories. I don't want to tell them. I just want to guide them through a conversation and let it, let them get it off their chest. And it's mm -hmm. been like fun. So I'm living the dream. And you appear to me to really be living your dream now, getting first count on your money, you're globe trotting once again, but not for Joe Blow Bobby. You're doing it on major scale. Talisk. I still follow that group. I love them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Amazing interview. Yeah. You know, I'm watching you jet setting and introducing and, and the young ladies where I I don't I, they were from Moscow, I think. They started out in Moscow. Oh. But Oh, you mean recently here at Masquerade when I went to that show, Pussy yeah. Riot, the ones that were jailed? Yeah, yeah they're yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then, you know, weren't you in Prague recently? I was. They invited me out to Prague to speak and do a workshop on PR marketing. Um, <clears throat> I did a global panel and I was out there scouting talent. Yeah, in Prague, Czech Republic. It's fantastic. Amazing. 
Yeah, yeah. What's the food like over there? I got to know. You know what? It's very heavy. A lot. It's good. It's it's a lot of meat. <clears throat> it's goulash. It's meat. It's stews. It's potatoes. It's breaded. It's, um, you know, <clears throat> the pastries are good. The there desserts go. are good. A lot of sweet stuff, you know, yeah. which I like. Yeah. Beer, beer all day long, beer in the morning, beer in lunch, beer at dinner, because it's a beer city. Um, uh, but um, you know, you can listen, if you were vegan or veggie there, you you could find spots. You could you could get a salad. It's just it's just that the meat is everywhere. You know what I mean? It's like you know, the the lamb and the and fish, they do a lot of great fish, a lot of smoked fish, mm. delicious smoked fish, mm. very delicious, a lot of cheesy dishes, a lot there of you cheese, go. like melted cheese yeah. all over the place like yeah. you know not great for the cholesterol or the heart but um they got pills you know, for that they got pills in, for that in moderation <laughs> exactly exactly they got pills for that yeah you know I mean? but you My know what cheese. was cool yeah they got pills for that you know what was cool though uh you know yeah that was czech republic and literally a week later i moved so it was a little hectic to come back from prague i could never say no to a all expenses paid trip to prague you know for the education for the profile for the you know networking opportunities for the discovery right the music discovery so of course i wasn't going to say no i'm like i gotta move next week no but i'm coming yeah my family thought i was mad they're like how the hell are you gonna do it i did what was beautiful was the second day i arrived or like maybe the third day i arrived because i arrived on thanksgiving mm. so much to be thankful for third day i arrived anthony david who's an incredible soul singer, soul R&B singer. He was with India RE at one point. He's got a collaborative um, record with Algebra, bless it, out of Atlanta. They're both really beloved here and international. They're not huge, but they, they've done well. Anyway, they had a number one gospel song on the Billboard chart, number one on the Billboard chart. Uh, it was a BB, <clears throat> BB and CC Winans 80s uh, classic called Heaven. Okay. It went to number one. I worked that song for over a year relentlessly over a year so guess what when it finally went to number one yeah david hand delivered me this billboard plaque so it's going to go on my wall as you can see i've got a blank wall i can do so many things with this wall this is going to go on my wall 100 percent. congratulations thank congratulations you. Thank that's you. not your first one is it <laughs> oh you know okay I, I should have some plaques i should have some plaques but like i told you my story has been left out. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I haven't had a lot of credit until I write my own story and put my own uh, piece and my journey into the mix. I have to do it myself. I mean, there are people starting to realize, oh my God, I should have interviewed you. Oh, I did the doc, I couldn't find you. Or, you know, there were things I, w I wasn't available for, but it's okay. Yes, to answer your question, this is my first. I've had artists with Grammy nominations, haven't had a Grammy winner yet, mm -hmm. and haven't had haven't had those plaques, haven't had a platinum plaque, haven't had a gold plaque. Probably should have with MF Doom. Probably should have with Black Alicious and a few others, but an atmosphere. But no, didn't didn't get those plaques. Didn't get. Well, those you plaques. know, I'm gonna I'm a loud mouth. This is gonna go everywhere, <laughs> well, and we'll have well, we'll have a we'll have a we'll have a a great. You'll be able to say that somebody in the media you know, treated you right. And yeah. I will do everything that I possibly can. Look, you've got a lot of stuff coming up. You know, we, we've sat a couple of times and you're you're talking about music conferences and things. Do you have anything yes. um, in the near future that's on the slate that you want to talk about for 24? You know what? Absolutely. So January, I'm going to be in Scotland and Ireland because again, I'm all over the place musically. <laughs> I'm being flown out to speak at this Roots Are Showing conference, which is a Celtic conference in Ireland. I've never been to Ireland, even though I'm English, never been to Ireland. Been to Scotland a few times. So after Ireland, I'll be speaking all over the place in Ireland. Then I go to Scotland, to Glasgow for a thing called Showcase Scotland. And Talisk is headlining this huge, famous venue called Barrowlands. Massive. That's mm. where Simple Minds, Simple Minds open the Barrowlands. And they headline the Barrel Alliance and they have like, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It's a massive place. Talisk is playing it at this Showcase Scotland. So They're amazing people. Yeah. They are yeah. amazing live. They that are. 
So I'm excited about that because I also picked up another Scottish band. Uh, it's not official yet, but well, I mean, it's official. I just haven't started with them yet. And really great Scottish band from Inverness called Elephant Sessions. So you'll be hearing a lot about them. Uh, what do I know I about Inverness? By Southwest this year. Yeah, they're kind of like a, like a soulful, electronic, Celtic band. A lot of flavor, a lot of flavor. Looks like I'm going to be doing their tour press in the summer and going into the fall next year. So I'm very excited about Elephant Sessions. And then I'll be in Kansas City, in your neck of the woods, for Come Folk on, Alliance. Man. For Folk Alliance in February. Uh, bringing I a always go to band. Folk Alliance. You, you I, I always go that? to Folk Alliance. I used to go to the wow. Renaissance Fair and the Folk Alliance and then in the same place at Sandstone, I think it's Hilled, and then uh, yeah. Renaissance. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh right, my God, right Jerry. The from the well, you're going to have to come and see, you're going to have to write about my band from Wales called The Trials of Cato. You know, I apologize <laughs> that I don't write about your people more. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm one person. I no, really I get, get 300 pitches a day. Uh, I don't have an assistant. So I'm like, man, I've got to figure out a way yeah. to, to set up a web hook. So when it says Fiona Bloom, it automatically gets drugged into the to the site, you know. Wouldn't so, that be nice? Wouldn't that yeah. be nice? Make I'm, all our I'm, lives easier. All I'm, our I'm, lives. I'm learning how to code. But, yeah. So that's February, Jerry. <laughs> okay, so that's, okay. So I better see you there. I'll take you to dinner. You'll come to my show. You'll interview them, hopefully. And then in March, South by Southwest, if all goes accordingly, I'll have about four acts there. So far, I have I'll two. be there this year. I'll be Great. there. Great. So Personally, I have the I'll be there. Amazing. Yeah. So I have the French rapper, Tracy Dessart. She's going to be doing the International Hip Hop Showcase. You'll love her, Jerry. You'll love Tracy. And then Zeta. Zeta will be there. And then I'm hoping that we get confirmation for Carrie Abel and also another artist called Sierra Miles. Mm. And if that happens, I'll have four acts down at South by. Wow. So I'll hey, be I know I'll be where I know where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. Wherever Fiona's yeah. at, that's where I'm going. That's right. That's right. I appreciate that's right. you. That's right. You took really good care of me. I appreciate it. You know, uh South by Southwest 2015. Yeah. yeah. Took good care wow. of me. The 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 uh Irish Fest here mm -hmm. in Kansas City. Yes. You know, yes. walked around. I spent money I shouldn't have. But no. for your wife, for your wife. Though. Yeah, it was great. She she loved it. She hasn't used yeah. that cutting board yet, though. Um, oh, oh. But she likes it. She's like, it's too pretty to use. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was it was it was dope. I had a really great time. You know, fun. you know, fun. you said that people haven't told your story, but I know that you know. I'm looking here, uh, where you know they've covered you quite a bit in the media. But yeah, yeah, yeah. is there a question that we in the media perhaps haven't asked you that you always wanted to address something like, hmm. they never talked to me about this. You know, everybody could ask you about being a woman in the business. It's the same mm -hmm. sad mm -hmm. story constantly, mm -hmm. but yeah. you're a beacon of light. Of yeah. You can't stop me. So yeah. there's no sense in going there, but is there something you would, if you were interviewing yourself, what would you ask you? You know what, Jerry? I would want to talk about the failures because without talking about failures, without addressing failures, mm -hmm. there's no encouragement or education or <laughs> understanding on how to become successful. We only hear about people's successes. We talk about you know success and we revel in success and we give them flowers and all the contributions and all of these other things. But what we don't address enough is how long it took you to get there. Because sometimes you feel like it's like you read about somebody and it's like, I'm just hearing about them. So that must've happened for them like relatively short time, but then you'll have a chat with them personally and they'll be like, ah, oh, no, that, I, 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 I was 20 years in this business before that happened. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you were? It was like the, the way they painted that story was like, you've been doing this for three years and boom, you got the break and here you are. So we don't talk enough about the trials and tribulations and the errors and the mistakes, the wrong decisions, the failures. It's okay if you made a bad decision. Let's talk about that bad decision. Ask me, not you, but in general, ask me about that bad decision. I've made a load of bad decisions, Jerry, a load, a load. 
But you learn, that's how you learn from those mistakes and you learn from those decisions that weren't good decisions. You learn from those and you hope to God you don't do them again or make those same you know, mistakes again. Sometimes I do, guess what? Sometimes I make that mistake again and again and I'll do it until I die. Like, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not a rocket scientist. I will, you know, fall flat again, maybe. Who knows? Or, I'll, you know, there'll be an up and down again. There'll be hiccups. There's, there's always going to be that. There's always ebb and flow and ebb and flow. And I wish people would take the time to talk to celebrities, period, about that. Also about, you know, fear of public speaking or fear of performing. Like, you know, a lot of performers or celebrities you know, what do they do before they're about to go on stage? They're shitting bricks, like no pun intended, like not being, you know, filthy or vulgar, but literally shitting themselves. Like they're freaking out. They're like a mess, but you'll ne but they don't talk about that. They don't talk about that. We need to hear that. Kids need to hear that. Young folk coming up need to hear these stories so that they know themselves, hey, I'm okay. I'm not. This is normal. Everything that's happening to me, happening to me right now is normal. Falling on my face, falling down, you know, failing is normal. I'm not an outcast. I'm not, you know, a bad person. I'm not an idiot. I, if we only knew that and had that, and that story came out and was talked about openly, we'd have more confidence with these younger kids and these new generations that are coming up, and we'd have more fearless people getting out there and doing it and chasing their dreams. Mm. And that's what I wish. That's what I want. Well, we, we covered a couple of your hard times going through. We didn't get in depth, but I understand what you're saying is, you know, we, we don't ask. Well, I ask as I get nosy. I'm yeah, like, you, you know, everything you wasn't, ask. everything wasn't perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, when you describe someone coming from, basically the streets to the suites, so to speak, you have to cover those benchmark moments, those experiences in between A to Z that, you know, define who you are once you get to Z. Right. And the career maybe, you know, also helps define you as a person because of the experiences and things like that. So, you know, you, we talked about, you know, a couple of heart wrenching and gut wrenching things that have happened to you throughout um, the career, but, you know, they seem to be organically happen, not something that, you know, you made a mistake doing. Do you have a huge mistake that you, we don't even have to talk about it. We could do it another time, but. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I've had some huge, <laughs> I've had, I've had some a huge couple. mistakes. I, I mean, listen, what, I mean, like I did sort of, you know, touch upon the one huge mistake with not having paperwork with right. that Commodore meeting, with that multi-million dollar deal with Doug Morris and Daniel Glass and me getting a $7,000 bonus. I mean, I really should have had my paperwork together because I could have bought a house after that. Like I, you know, so I mean, you know, there's major mistakes in that realm. Um, and then, you know, other major mistakes are artists I could have signed that I didn't. You know, demos I didn't listen to in time and then somebody else swept them up. I, it came to me first. A demo came to me or an email came to me or somebody was desperately wanting to work with me or partner with me. And I slept on it. I slept on it. I didn't I didn't move fast enough or maybe I was too busy and didn't get to them in time. And then, boom, when it was time to address it, they moved on and they were already winning in their lane, doing their own thing. And uh, those I've had a lot of those stories, a lot of those stories. I don't want to. Do it. I don't want to have any more of those stories, but I've had a lot of them. So, but you know what? To your, I think, <clears throat> in your defense, I'll defend you for you. Yeah. You know the fact that your workload as an independent, moving around, making a difference, you're not going to be able to catch every move that you wish. You know that yeah. would. You know these people. You know were crazy. So it's unrealistic. I think that one of the things that we forget to do is is assign ourselves realistic expectations yeah. in this industry. Yeah. And you know, people like you said before, you know, that we're hype magazine is we're 21 years, mm -hmm. you know, um as of this year. Wow, and yeah. so, you know, but here I am 21 years, I'm just getting to talk to a publicist of your caliber. Mm, wow okay Woo, i'm you know, glad that it was me wow well you know i've done other other pr people but they've yeah. not moved the needle right 
in a but, culture. But I'm not, but I said I'm a multi-hyphenate. I'm not, I don't consider myself just a publicist. I do. I didn't so mean it. I didn't mean it yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, but, so it's not, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, I have to put it in a common term yeah, yeah. for the regular people to oh. kind of put it there. So, yeah, and there's yeah. levels to this, you know, you had Norman Winters who was, you know, the PR person for Vogue magazine. Mm. That's a level, you know, you had, you know, George dad price, rest in peace, who was the handler for death row records. Mm. You know, mm. all of these gentlemen are in my circle yeah, and they had yeah. different points yeah you're in my circle and um i just gonna talk about it like look i am i am doing an interview people and my phone is dinging it's on my calendar you people work with me why are you dinging me stop oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> right anyway is there anything i'm gonna cut that out i'm clouded <laughs> This is a really a live session, though, y'all. I yeah. promise you. The Hype Magazine <laughs> live sessions. I'll be editing the Chief Jerry Doby. This is Fiona Bloom, Bloom Effect. Yes. Is there anything you wanted to cover that I may have neglected? Oh, wow. I mean, really, we went through a lot. I mean, you know, I started out as a musician. Did we talk about that? Did we talk we about did. musician? Piano. You wanted to be a piano. Oh, yeah, we did. We did. We did. Yeah. H4. yeah. I got super burnt out. Yeah. I mean, I think we covered all of it. We covered being a musician to being on radio to, you know, doing a jazz show, to discovering two turntables on a microphone, to immersing myself into full-on hip-hop, to building scenes and cultures, to, you know, getting into major record labels, moving into New York and working at uh, other independent uh, entities and, you know, building out uh, conferences and international hip-hop movements and, you know, giving a lot of artists day ones. Like, I, I think my book might be called Day One because, you know, the Fat Joe Day One, the Atmosphere Day One, you know, the... George, I mean, there's so many, you know, there's loads of day ones. Um, so I, you know, I don't know that I'm sort of toying with that idea of day one, you know. Um, but no, I mean, I think we covered, I mean, if anything, the only thing that we didn't really dabble on was the fact that I'm very, I think outside the box. I'm a very um, unique, um, I, I have a unique way of, of uh, executing my marketing and uh, PR and discovery. Um, because I look at technology in a huge way. Um, every new platform that comes up, every new, you know, engaging platform that's uh, giving us tools or features or, you know, whether it's AI, whether it's NFTs, whether it's blockchain, whether it's 3D, whether it's, you know, VR and headsets. And, you know, I just I've sort of put myself in those arenas and just uh, been a sponge to basically absorb and learn as much as I can about all the new technologies. And a lot of people don't bring that up when they talk to me, but technology has been a very big part of my career. I've always been known as an early adapter, an early adopter, early adapter, cutting edge, everything, not just on music, but cutting edge in entertainment. And uh, the other big thing is not just a number one hustler, but probably without tooting my own horn, probably one of the biggest networkers on the planet. Watched you work, not a stranger in the house. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah. I look yeah. forward to uh, hopefully working with you myself. At yeah. Some point. Bring it. And, Bring uh, it. Let's do it. You know, do it. I am, um, when you do these conferences, I'd love to, I'd love to be, you know, explore something with you. But anyway, for now, we're going to yeah, just give yeah. you your roses as a Rose woman it. who has taken an industry on her back and I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to get her flowers. That's right. <laughs> just take Fiona Bloom, you know, yeah, from sorry. a multi-hyphenate, yeah. a polymath, if you will. Mm -hmm. She is an expert in multiple things. Oh, you're dinging. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, a multi-hyphenate, a polymath, like I was saying, I'm going to get it out. They're going to leave yes. me. Um, she's an expert in a lot of areas and she's yeah. made a difference in a lot of areas. And when you have someone who loves what they do, there's no one more dangerous 
to a lazy person in the industry than one who loves the culture, loves what they do. They're highly motivated and they perform and deliver at an impeccable level. And yeah, arguably one of my favorite people. Oh, oh, thank you, Joe. Well, I love Showed you me love from day one. Yeah. Night Magazine, I really appreciate you. <laughs> I really appreciate you. Come on, you know I'm a pain in your ass sometimes. Just say it. <laughs> nah, you're not. <laughs> I have a 16-year-old daughter. That's a pain in my ass. Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah, a whole yeah, yeah. other thing. <laughs> and she's yeah. driving now, for God's sake. Ooh, time. watch out. Watch yeah, out. Independence. Oh, my God. Just don't take it to Atlanta because they drive like maniacs here. Tell her to stay away. My mother from drives like a maniac, so she's oh. getting trained already. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. It, was, it was good. Oh, yeah. All right, everybody. The Hype Magazine live session is Fiona Bloom, my friend, one of the industry's most remarkable individuals from marketing, PR, media, networking, conferencing, speaking, teaching, educating, giving a shit about those navigating the maze of the industry, shining a light on those that have earned it. And you never know what corner of the earth you're going to find her doing one of those wild lives from, whether it's Prague, whether it's France, whether it's Atlanta, LA, Kansas City. Yep. The Bloom effect is real. It lights <laughs> up every place she's at. Until oh. next time, my friend, I thank you so much for your time and your patience with me. Thank you, Jerry. This was fun. Thank you so much. Appreciate oh, it. All right. <laughs> Appreciate you. All right. <laughs> hey, yo, what's up? This is IC representing for Hype Magazine. Stop playing. As an artist, we should reflect the time. Cause I'm black. Why you so amazing? Cause I'm black. It's really important that we build characters so that people understand their story matters. Two Chains and I both are just really into good food. And when you know you are royalty, you will only aim in life to be royalty. We're doing it right now. I don't give a damn what they say about me. Yes, I called your ass out. I know I shouldn't be saying this kind of Shout out to Hype Magazine Network. Shout out to the Hype Magazine Network.